So pleasure to be here, Recess X. I thank Haney and the group for bringing me back. It's always good to come back to the East Coast. Now I'm in San Antonio where it's hot and very red, but now I'm good on the East Coast again. So we're gonna talk about refractory hyperkalemia. So we're gonna start off with a case. So this is your patient. He's a 47 year old gentleman. He doesn't have any history of anything other than hy uh, hypertension. And he decides he's gonna go out and run a marathon. While he's training for this marathon, he starts to get a little fatigued and weak. He's not really drinking like he's supposed to. And he's coming into the emergency department, complaining not really of any chest pain or shortness of breath, mostly just fatigue and feeling very run down. He's diaphoretic. You get the EKG on him and it looks like this. That doesn't look too awesome. So you're like, it's not a STEMI. Clearly there's something going on with this EKG. I don't have a baseline to look at, but let's check his electrolytes. And his potassium comes back and it's this high. Now, in your mind, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, I know how to do this. So you start to do the things that you know how to do. You're going to give the medications. You're going to start him on all of the things that he needs to be on for his hyperkalemia. And then you go back and you look at his EKG and it looks like this. Now, it still doesn't look awesome, but you still don't see ST elevations. And you repeat the labs and you see that his potassium is not significantly change. Now, what do you do? What's the next step in this patient who has refractory hyperkalemia? So that's what we're going to talk about. What to do with patients with refractory hyperkalemia. Now, we know that when we see patients who have this on their arm, there's not really a whole lot of other things to do. We do the things that we know how to do, but we know that we're not going to fix these patients relatively quickly. But with everybody else, it may be a little bit different in terms of how we manage these patients. So let's start off with pitfall number one. The first pitfall is not giving enough calcium. And we know what calcium does. It does nothing to actually remove the potassium from the body. It mainly stabilizes the cardiac membrane. But do we need to give calcium to every single hyperkalemic patient who comes into the emergency department? And there's literature that says maybe not. If you start to see these significant EKG changes, and we're talking about QRS prolongation, prolonged QT, PR prolongation, significant AV blocks, those patients obviously need calcium. But when we see just those baby little tiny PT waves, there may not be a need to give calcium to those patients because those are not the patients who are going to have significant adverse outcomes. And this paper shows that the risk of a short-term adverse outcome with just peak T waves alone is very, very low compared to these very significant other EKG changes. So what do we do when we see these significant EKG changes? We know that we're going to give calcium to those patients. And typically, we're going to stick with the two types of calcium that we know of, which is calcium gluconate and calcium chloride. Calcium chloride predominantly going through central access, calcium gluconate going through peripheral access. And we typically start with two to four grams of calcium gluconate, one gram of calcium chloride in patients with EKG changes with hyperkalemia. What we want to see in the EKG when we give calcium is a change in the EKG. And what we typically do not do enough of is giving enough calcium to wait to see if that change actually manifests. We see an EKG like this and we think, just give them the calcium and that's all we do. So if we see the change from that to this, we know that we've actually given enough calcium. But what happens when that EKG doesn't change? We've given three grams of calcium gluconate. The EKG remains the same. We still see that prolonged QRS. We still see that prolonged PR interval. We still see those AV blocks. We have to remember to give more. And so what we typically will say is if you give calcium gluconate and you give enough of it and there's no EKG changes, repeat the dose every five to 10 minutes for one to two doses. Is there anything wrong with the patient becoming hypercalcemic? Not really, because what's the treatment for hypercalcemia? Calcemia? Fluids, 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 fluids. So we're going to end up giving fluids in the long run anyway in most patients, which we'll talk about very shortly. But don't forget to treat the patient's EKG changes with enough calcium to manifest. Remembering also that calcium lasts about 30 to 60 minutes, so you may see a recurrence of the previous EKG changes that you saw before, and you may need to give some more calcium. So pro number one, make sure you give enough calcium. Repeat the calcium dose if there's no significant EKG changes for the better. 
Pitfall number two is not giving enough medications to shift the potassium out of the cell. In terms of medications that we typically use to shift potassium out of the cell, we have three flavors, sodium bicarb, insulin, and albuterol or beta agonists. So when we think about sodium bicarbonate, do we give that to everybody? And I would make a plea to you, don't push amps of sodium bicarb in patients with hyperkalemia. If you're going to give any sodium bicarbonate, one, it should be patients who are acidotic. And two, think about an, ins I'm sorry, a bicarbonate infusion, isotonic bicarbonate instead of bicarbonate pushes. What about beta agonists? Well, we know that when we're treating patients with asthma, typically we're using five milligrams. That's simple dosing. For patients with hyperkalemia, we got to go big or go home. So we're going to give 10 to 15 milligrams per hour in patients who have significant hyperkalemia. What about insulin and dextrose? Now, there's been some recent literature that's looked at insulin dosing in patients with hyperkalemia. And what's the appropriate dose? Because we're scared of patients going hypoglycemic. And here's a paper that looked at that. Reveal ED study found that patients, 6% of overall patients who had hyperkalemia got hypoglycemic as a result of the insulin dose that was administered to them. And 17% of patients who had significant hyperkalemia, potassium greater than 7.2 experienced episodes of hypoglycemia. So there's been some recent looks at dosing. And so this is a low dose protocol, about 200 patients. And what they found is that if you give less insulin, there's less incidence of hypoglycemia. Interesting. That makes sense. Give low-dose insulin, they don't have as much hypoglycemia. So that's great. But this study actually changed things a little bit. Now, this was, they excluded patients who had end-stage renal disease, but they gave them low-dose 5 units versus 10 units of insulin. And what they actually found is that the incidence of hypoglycemia was about the same. But which one was better at actually lowering the potassium to a significant level? What they actually found is that 10 units works better than five units. So in the grand scheme of things, what should we be doing differently? And I make the argument that we should stick with the usual dosing of 10 units and just increase the dextrose. So instead of giving one amp of D50, I actually give two amps. I give one amp with the insulin, 10 units, and then I give a second amp about 30 minutes later to prevent them from going hypoglycemic and let them eat. Let them eat cake. If they're going to eat, allow them to eat so that they don't drop their sugar. I hate to break in here, but if you are enjoying this lecture right now, then you want to check out the entire Recess X reunion filmed live in Philadelphia 2024. There are over 60 talks that you can watch on replay for life. Right now, we have a coupon that gets you 20% off that entire package. Again, 20% off to watch the entire conference for life. So if you're enjoying this video and you want to watch lots more, Go to the link below and sign up. Now back to the video. What happens if that doesn't work though? You've given them the 10 units, check their sugar or they check their potassium a couple of hours later and it's still the same. We still do the insulin and dextrose, but I don't give it to them in a bolus at that point in time. If it's refractory, I make the argument that we should put them on a drip. Start them on an insulin drip, and people worry, oh my gosh, the patient's going to get hypoglycemic. Well, if you start them on a D10 infusion, which will help turn the kidneys back on, help them to excrete the potassium on their own, it also dilutes the potassium intravascularly, and it helps prevent them from going hypoglycemic. This has actually been found to work in patients who have refractory hyperkalemia. So I make the argument, start them on an insulin drip. Sodium bicarbonate, as we talked about before, if you're going to give it, give it to them in an infusion. And I make the argument to start them on three amps of sodium bicarbonate in a D5 drip. And don't run it at 250 milliliters an hour. Give them 500 a liter per hour to actually start their kidneys back up and actually give them a little bit of volume. So parallel number two, low dose insulin, not as effective as regular dose of 10 units of insulin for patients with hyperkalemia. Two amps of D50 instead of the one amp that we traditionally use. And then lastly, consider using an insulin infusion in your patients with refractory hyperkalemia. Last thing we're going to talk about is how to eliminate potassium from the system. How are we going to get this out? And so sometimes we don't do enough. We know that this is probably going to end up being the case in a lot of our patients, obviously, with end stage renal disease. We're going to get a nephrologist on board and they're going to take a little bit of time to get into most of our emergency departments and most of our critical care units in terms 
of getting these patients dialyzed as quickly as possible. What about the diarrheal things? The GI absorbents that actually absorb potassium and cause you to poop it out. Is that a great thing to use? These are the three that are classically used. And one of these, I make the argument that we shouldn't be using at all, and that's KX Lake. We should not be using that in any way, shape, or form anymore. It causes gut necrosis, has been associated with bad outcomes and lawsuits. But the other two are a little bit safer, not as many incidences of, in of intestinal necrosis, but do they work? In patients who are acutely hyperkalemic in the emergency department or in the critical care units, these are not great medications to use because they take a long time to actually start working. So if you wanna give it just to say you've started something to start the process, that's fine. But in the grand scheme of things, if you're wanting to effectively remove potassium from the system, these are not the things to go to. So what we're typically going to rely on is diuresis, or what some people like to call caliuresis, or the removal of potassium through the urine. And this is a great way to do, especially in patients who are fluid overloaded. In these patients, we're typically going to give diuretics, which is going to help remove the potassium from the cell. Typically, we're going to use loop diuretics and furosemide as the go-to. This is not the standard dose, but I always make the argument if a patient is hyperkalemic and you're trying to effectively remove potassium, hit their kidneys hard. Giving them 10, 20 milligrams is like pissing in the wind. It's literally just like, let me just give you a little sprinkle of furosemide. All right, we want to hit those kidneys hard so that the kidneys are like, oh, they really want me to work. Let's get rid of the potassium that's in the cell. But the other thing to think about is IV fluids. IV fluids are a completely effective way as long as the patient is able to make urine. Now, when most people think about IV fluids, they talk about the not so normal, normal saline. And we have heard before that normal saline is not necessarily the best medication to use. But in terms of fluid hydration, what it actually does is giving them some fluids causes some volume expansion and the kidneys that may have been shut off due to decreased perfusion may actually turn back on and as they turn back on, what you'll start to see is they'll make urine, and that urine will actually start to spill potassium out into the urine. And there's literature that shows that balanced solutions are actually great for this. So despite the fact that balanced solutions have potassium inside of them, if you look at this paper, which was a subset analysis, a secondary analysis of the SMART trial, which compared balanced solutions versus normal saline, about 200 patients, they found that the patients who had hyperkalemia who got saline versus balanced solutions had a higher incidence of severe hyperkalemia with saline. So if you're going to give them fluids, give them balanced solutions. So this is my algorithm for patients who come in with hyperkalemia in terms of removal. If they don't make urine, dialysis is the only way. If they do make urine, if they're not fluid overloaded, you can give them some IV fluids. If they're fluid overloaded, primarily focus on loop diuretics. But again, what if the potassium is refractory? It's not changing. It's not getting any better. What do we do in those patients? I say you still got to hit them pretty hard. You have to hit these patients with a hard dose of diuretics. So I actually hit them with a big dose of Lasix, 100 to 200 milligrams of Lasix. And I also hit them with a medication that we don't oftentimes use in our critical care and in emergency department settings, which is chlorothiazide. This is an IV thiazide diuretic. By itself, does not work very well for hyperkalemia and potassium removal. However, in the combination of furosemide and thiazide diuretic, we're actually hitting them with something called, which some people like Dr. Farkas likes to call a nephron bomb. It is a kidney bomb that's telling the kidneys, get rid of this potassium as quickly as possible. And this has been shown to be very effective for removing potassium and increasing diuresis. You have to monitor their urine output. If their urine output doesn't start to increase with this big bomb, it's probably not going to work, and you're going to end up moving to dialysis in the long run anyway. And then if you start to get a little bit of movement, you may even consider starting these patients on a furosemide drip to actually help spur the kidneys to continue to get rid of the potassium as well in refractory cases. So pro number three, use balanced solutions for any type of volume expansion, and then consider using larger doses of furosemide or potentially even a, an infusion in patients with refractory hyperkalemia. So big take-home pearls that I hope that you took home from this talk. Number one is repeat your dose of calcium until those significant EKG, EKG changes change. 
Number two is give an appropriate dose of insulin, 10 units. Consider an insulin infusion if refractory. Number three, balanced solutions for patients who need volume expansion. And then consider larger doses of furosemide or an infusion in patients with refractory hyperkalemia. And with that, I thank you for your